My name is Ed Boyd and I'm a Tea Party Patriot local coordinator. My name is Amanda Wong and I'm a public health student at UC Berkeley. My name is Brian. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. My name is Josh Bookin, and I'm speaking to you from Harvard's Graduate School of Education. My name is Don Lovett. I live in a homeless shelter in Glendale. My name is Josie DeLuca from Bloomington, Indiana. My name is Carrie Shangerly. My name is Vicki, and I'm from Pembroke Pines, Florida. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the White House. My name is Steve Grove, and I'm the head of news and politics at YouTube. And we're delighted that President Obama has once again invited us to the White House to answer your top voted questions in the first exclusive interview after the State of the Union speech. Welcome back to YouTube, Mr. President. It's great to be here, Steve. Thank you so much for doing this. Well, I should tell you, Mr. President, that over 140,000 questions were submitted uh -huh. on YouTube over the past uh, few days. Over a million votes cast. You see some of these videos here flying over the, the map of the USA. We're trying to do as many of these as you possibly can today. And let's just get right into it. Let's, let's dive in. The first question is from America's Heartland. I'm Richard Lauk from Akron, Ohio. Mr. President, I just got out of the Marine Corps infantry after serving two tours in Afghanistan. And now I'm unemployed. How are you going to help people like me? Well, th th this is a great question. Uh, as you know, we have over a million people who now have served either in Iraq or Afghanistan. All of them have done extraordinary work. And it is our moral obligation to make sure that we are serving them as well as they've served us. Uh, and so there are a couple of things that we're doing right away. Uh, number one, uh, the Department of Defense and the VA uh, are working together to make sure that we've got a career counseling program available. The minute folks uh, are getting out of the armed services, we are helping them to make sure that they know where to land, uh, what kinds of skills are transferable to what industries. Mm -hmm. We're trying to gather up companies who are willing to uh, hire uh, folks who have come out of the military, and we are making a big push with employers to say, these folks have shown leadership, they have been trained, they have performed at high levels in very difficult situations. They're going to be great assets to help rebuild the country. Uh, but beyond uh, Department of Defense and to Veterans Affairs, I've given a, a presidential directive to every agency to make sure that they are looking to hire veterans, that job training programs, uh, social service programs, anything that we've got in any of the agencies, housing, mm -hmm. education, you name it, that they are directed especially to making sure that these veterans are served. What about job creation overall? Um, you know, Wayne from Artesia, California asked, you know, he's a, he's a recent college graduate, graduate, he says, how are you going to uh, help recent co college graduates like myself when there are fewer highly competitive points of entry? We've done everything by the book with little success and we find ourselves in huge debt. Right. Well, a couple of points here. First of all, uh, the reason they're in huge debt is because the cost of college education mm -hmm. is so high. Uh, and that's why we've put such a big emphasis on eliminating uh, unwarranted subsidies to banks shifting billions of dollars into our student loan programs. Uh, we've now made it so that young people, when they get out, shouldn't have to pay more than 10% of their income uh, to repaying their student debt, which alleviates a big burden mm -hmm. on them. Uh, we were talking about veterans earlier. Obviously, the post-9-11 GI Bill is a huge asset for making sure our veterans uh, and their spouses are able to uh, get the training they need. But the overall jobs picture is still really tough out there. We created a million, uh, million 300,000 jobs last year in the private sector, uh, which is a lot better than we had been doing, but it's still not enough. And so that's why accelerating economic growth, the tax package that we, uh, that we passed uh, during the lame duck session that is providing incentives to business to uh, you know, invest in business and mm -hmm. equipment this year, uh, making sure that there's a payroll tax cut that can spur more consumer spending and economic growth. All those things are going to be absolutely critical, but uh, you know, obviously if you don't have a job right now, uh, it's tough. And, 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 and we've got to make sure that we're focused exclusively on economic growth uh, over these next 12 months. A lot of these job creation programs cost money, and a lot of Americans are worried about the debt. Right. Let's go to, to Charles Wagster, who writes, Mr. President, you have all these plans to help the nation's businesses create new jobs. All these programs you plan on making will cost money. 
What cuts and what programs do you plan to cut in order to start reducing our debt? Well, as I announced at the State of the Union, what we're going to be doing is freezing domestic discretionary spending for the next five years. Now, keep in mind that a freeze actually ends up being a cut because the population is going up. Uh, you end up having some slight inflation. And when you combine both increased population and uh, inflation, just keeping things stable actually means we have to cut programs. And what and sorts of things, what sorts of programs do you think well, are going to get cut? Uh, you know, we're going to be announcing our budget, so I don't want to give too much details because then nobody uh, pays attention when we actually put the numbers out. Uh, but uh, there are going to be programs uh, like community action grants, for example, that really help uh, cities and local communities uh, to spur economic development. But, you know, frankly, we're just going to have to trim uh, mm -hmm. some of these programs. And uh, these are not going to be across the board. We want to cut with a scalpel as opposed to uh, a chainsaw. Uh, there are going to be some areas where we actually increase spending. Education is one, uh, research and development uh, and innovation. We need to make sure that we're staying on the cutting edge of new technologies. But we're going to have to make some serious decisions. I can tell you that the budget is going to end up saving $400 billion or so. Uh, and it will mean that domestic discretionary spending goes down to the lowest level since Dwight Eisenhower's, since the lower, uh, lowest level, mm -hmm. uh, the lowest level since I was born, uh, certainly since you were born. <laughs> well, you mentioned education is an area that would not get cut. Let's go to the category of education. This question comes from a charter school in Your 2008 California. speech on race, you said that many of the, so the social and economic disparities that exist in the African American community can be, and I quote, directly traced to inequalities passed on from an earlier generation that suffered under the brutal legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. How do you plan on addressing these social and economic disparities that currently exist in minority communities? In particular, what is your plan to close the pervasive achievement gap in education for American minorities today? Well, the first thing uh, that we've got to remember, and I said this at the State of the Union, is that nothing government does replaces the importance of parents in education. And so uh, all of us, uh, regardless of our station, our race, where, what region of the country we're coming from, if we're parents, we've got to step up our game in working with our kids to learn. Uh, reading to them, turning off the TV, making sure they're doing their homework. Mm -hmm. you know, building a culture uh, around the love of learning is critical. But our schools have a special role to play, obviously. Uh, and the single most important thing that we can do in closing the achievement gap is making sure that we've got good teachers in the classroom that are setting high expectations for our kids. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the challenges we have is a lot of times in poor neighborhoods, higher, na uh, higher minority mm -hmm. uh, student populations, uh, oftentimes the teachers don't have as much experience in the subject matter that they're teaching. Um, you know, in, in a lot of communities, we need to provide more incentives for the best teachers to teach in the hardest to teach schools, as opposed to uh, a lot of times their impulse, uh, particularly if they have seniority, is to go to suburban schools or, yeah, uh, or in wealthier communities where the kids are better prepared. And that's understandable, but we've got to put a special focus on making sure that uh, uh, those schools that really need help are getting the best possible resources. One of the things we're doing with what's called Race to the Top, uh, the program that uh, Secretary Duncan uh, and uh, myself have been promoting, is we're saying to states, you get some additional money if you've got a real good game plan for those lowest performing schools. Uh, and we don't want any child out there not having the best possible chance uh, at succeeding. And one of the reasons it's so important uh, to close the achievement gap is the population is going to be increasingly Hispanic, increasingly mm -hmm. African American. Those are uh, fast growing populations, increasingly Asian. And, and so if we're not doing a great job educating uh, those kids and closing some of those achievement gaps, we're going to have problems you know, as, you as a country. Right. You mentioned race to the top, and a lot of people wrote in about race to the top, right. wondering what's going to happen this year. Political environment's a little bit different. Uh, Padma from Jericho, New York, wrote, Mr. President, where are you going to get the money to fund race to the top, and how do you expect schools with depleted resources to actually compete for this funding? Well, keep in mind, race to the top uh, only costs 1% of what we spend overall on education. Right. That, that's the, the wonderful thing about the program is schools are still getting general support. 
that's formula based, meaning that each state, depending on its population and uh, the number of uh, children it has that are in low income categories, are getting a certain amount of federal money. All we're saying is let's carve out a little bit of this money and create a, a contest among states saying if you've got the best plan to improve teacher quality, make sure that you're setting high performance, you're setting up uh, a, a way of tracking whether or not the kids are doing well. If you do that, then we'll give you a little bit extra. And Is that contest going to have money this year to it, it, as it, it certainly will be in my budget and I think that uh, given that uh, we've had 40 states that have reformed their school systems just because of Race to the Top uh, and it's got widespread su uh, support from both Democrats and Republicans, uh, I see no reason why we shouldn't be able to get it done again this year. Mr. President, this is the internet, and on the internet, uh, people love to have a more personal relationship with their elected officials. So let's move into sort of a YouTube rapid round. Uh, we'll call it Get to Know Your President. All right. Uh, let me flip to it here. There we go. These are some personal questions people have submitted. First one, maybe just one or two sentences on each if you can. Sure. What's the best part about being president, and what's the worst part? Uh, best part of being president is every once in a while, you do something that you know has a direct impact on somebody. So when, uh, when we passed health care and I met a woman who was not going to lose her house mm -hmm. because she was able to get her cancer treatments, uh, and she comes up and says, thank you. Nothing's more satisfying than that. Uh, toughest pay thing about being president is the bubble. Uh, I can't go for a walk. Uh, I can't go to the corner coffee shop. Right. Yeah. Uh, I can't uh, uh, leave the house and not uh, uh, shave. And, you know, right. have, have uh, my sweats on. <laughs> you like the president. <laughs> right. Because uh, uh, so, so that is, is something that I don't think I'll ever uh -huh. get used to. Next question, uh, Mr. President, what was your favorite class in college? Favorite class in college? Um, I had a wonderful political science class. Uh, I still remember the, the, the name of the uh, professor, Roger Boche at Occidental College. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it sparked my general interest in... Uh, uh, in, in politics, and, and uh, he still teaches there, and, and uh, was, was just a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful professor. Let's move to a, a critical question this week, or the next few weeks. Mr. President, who's winning the Super Bowl, Pittsburgh or Green Bay? This user, D.C. Gorman, picks the Packers 31-28. I'm sure you're still singing from the loss the other night, but who do you pick to win? Now that the Bears have lost, I've got to stay neutral. Uh, yeah. I already took a hard time from Charles Woodson. I don't know if you saw, uh, this is on YouTube, is uh, uh, his speech after uh, they won. Uh, where he says, the president doesn't want to uh, see us in Dallas, then we're going to see him in the White House. <laughs> and then they all said, one, two, three, White House. Really? And that then, was our call? I didn't see that. And, and so uh, I just came back from Wisconsin. First thing I get as I get off the plane is a signed Woodson jersey. <laughs> see you in the White House. So, now, Woodson's a great player and uh, uh, one confident. of my favorite players in the NFL. So. Uh, but, uh, but no picks? No picks. I, I, I'm, okay. I'm gonna, I've got to say... Uh, uh, absolutely neutral on this one, and uh, may the best team win. All righty. Next one, uh, what do you get Michelle for, uh, for Valentine's Day? Well, uh, I will tell you that uh, the, the more I'm campaigning, the more I'm president, uh, each Valentine's Day seems to get more expensive. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I've got more to make up for. Uh -huh. uh, you know, used to be I could just get away with flowers. Now, so something expensive. No. <laughs> Actually, the thing that she wants uh, usually most of all is time. So uh, yeah. we always try to uh, get a date night out uh, on Valentine's Day. Two more quick ones, and then we'll go back to some issue questions. Uh, the next one is uh, most people know your favorite sports teams and all that kind of stuff, but who's your favorite mathematician or, or scientist? You know, um, I will tell you that uh, lately my favorite uh, mathematicians and scientists are actually uh, folks that are, are not very well known. Um, I, I get a chance to meet them on a pretty regular basis uh, through uh, what's called uh, PCAST. It's my, the President's Council on mm. Science and Technology, okay. essentially. Uh, John Holdren, my chief science advisor, uh, is, is the lead on it. But uh, there, there's a guy, for example, uh, Eric Lander, Mm -hmm. uh, out of Harvard, who's, uh, who's the chair, who's just uh, a terrific mathematician, world-class mathematician, uh, has done 
extraordinary work on genetics, helped uh, on the Human Genome Project. Uh, but what I love about him is he's, he can explain things in, in English. So uh, people who are not as uh, mathematically savvy as me uh, can actually follow him. Uh, but what's also great is he, he has this wonderful passion for translating highly theoretical science into very practical terms. You know, how does this help right. us solve problems in energy? How does this help us solve problems in, when it comes to healthcare? Mm -hmm. uh, how can we improve biotechnical research? So uh, I've, one of the things I love about being president is actually having access to math and science. And part of what we're trying to do in this White House is to really ramp up the emphasis on math and science, especially among kids. That's why we had the yeah. first uh, science fair in quite some time uh, here at the White, the House. White House and met some kids. There, there was one young woman uh, from, from Dallas, I think it was, who she was only a junior in high school and had won an international science contest creating a new cancer drug. Um, she had taught school. herself chemistry uh, uh, between her freshman and sophomore years in high school because she was interested in it. And, um, now you've got companies calling her up wanting to work with her. She hasn't graduated from high school yet. Uh, wow. So uh, there's some serious brain power out there. Uh, we, we just have to tap it. Let's get to the last quick question here. A lot of people want to know what your favorite YouTube video is. Do you, do you have a favorite YouTube video? Um, you know, I have to say that I don't have a favorite YouTube video. Usually what happens is uh, Malia or Sasha will show me some YouTube video that they've, uh, uh, that they've discovered. Uh, and so you watch it with your kids? I watch it yeah, with my kids. Yeah. The, the, the main thing I use YouTube for, uh, I have to confess, is uh, um, highlights that I haven't seen. Sports uh, stuff. Sports stuff. Okay. Well, let's, let's play you a few YouTube videos, actually, that have come in from across the world, people actually documenting their experiences in, in relatively serious situations, right. in fact, very serious situations. These are some clips just over the past year that, that citizens have taken from the scenes of protests, um, documenting what's taking place. You can see uh, Tunisia and Thailand. And, and of course, most recently, Mr. President, over the past few days in Egypt, people have uh, taken to the streets in Cairo and been filming their experiences. Uh, a lot of people wrote in, you can see here from the, from the streets of Cairo, wondering your, your reaction to the events that are taking place there. Kam Hawi wrote in saying, Dear President Obama, regarding the current situation in the Middle East and Egypt over the past two days, what do you think of the Egyptian government blocking social networks and preventing people from expressing their opinions? Well, uh, let, let me say, first of all, that uh, you know, Egypt's been an ally of ours on a, a lot of critical issues. They made peace with Israel. Uh, President Mubarak has been very helpful on a range of uh, tough issues in the Middle East. Uh, but I've always said to him uh, that uh, making sure that they are moving forward on reform, political reform, economic reform, is absolutely critical mm -hmm. to the long-term well-being of Egypt. Uh, and you can see these pent-up frustrations that are uh, uh, being displayed on the streets. My main hope right now is, is that violence uh, is not the answer uh, in solving these problems in Egypt. Uh, so the government has to be careful about not resorting to violence, and the people on the streets have to be careful about not resorting to violence. Uh, and I think that it is very important that uh, people have mechanisms in order to express legitimate grievances. Uh, as I said uh, in uh, my State of the Union speech, there are certain core values that we believe in as Americans that we believe are universal, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Uh, people being able to use social networking or any other mechanisms uh, to communicate with each other and express mm -hmm. their concerns. Uh, and that, uh, I think, is, is no less true uh, in the Arab world than it is uh, here in the United States. Let's stay in the Middle East for a second, uh, go from Egypt to Afghanistan. I'm going to play you two questions back to back about the way forward in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. My name is Sheila Henneman. I'm from Brunswick, Ohio. And Mr. President, I was, have a son in the military. And I was just wondering um, what your, if you really feel that it is still important for our young men and women to be dying over in Iraq and Afghanistan. And just one more after this, and then we'll. I'm sorry, I actually need to push the button. Here we go. Mr. President, disrupting, dismantling, and defeating Al Qaeda and preventing its capacity to threaten the United States and our allies in the future is how you have defined our objective in Afghanistan. How do preventative wars costing the lives of innocent civilians in countries that have not attacked us distance your foreign policy from the Bush Doctrine or disprove the assertion of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s that the United States 
is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world? Well, uh, Dennis's question, I'm not sure uh, I, I buy into the premise. Uh, our work in Afghanistan is precisely because that was the launching pad from which 9-11 happened, and 3,000 Americans were killed. And so we're not over there by accident. Uh, obviously, I disagreed with uh, us going into Iraq, uh, but uh, I will say that we are bringing the war in Iraq to a honorable conclusion uh, because of the extraordinary service of uh, our men and women, uh, both military and civilian, in Iraq. We've still got work to do uh, in this transition, but by the end of this year, we'll have all our troops out. Uh, and the, Iraq, uh, the Iraqi people now have a government uh, that they will be looking to for governance and development. In Afghanistan, uh, we have uh, al-Qaeda and its allies. We have them along the border region in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And it is my job as president to make sure that they can't launch another 9-11 against us. Over the next couple of years, we are going to be transitioning so that we are bringing troops back. Afghans are taking a greater lead. Uh, the situation's not going to be perfect there. But what we have been able to do is to continually shrink the ability of al-Qaeda to launch operations. And we expect to dismantle their operational capacity uh, over the next several years. That is our goal, and we're going to keep on it. And, and maybe just real briefly to Sheila, the, the mother of the soldier who wants to know. Well, uh, as I said, we will be out of uh, Afghanistan by the end of this year. I mean, we'll have a uh, relationship with Iraq the same way we have relationships with many countries around the world. But, so out of Afghanistan is in? But combat operations in Afghanistan have ended. Uh, and under the strategic framework agreement that we signed with Iraq, uh, we're not going to be having uh, uh, large contingents of troops there. Afghanistan is a tougher situation. Uh, but what I've said is, is that starting in July of this year, we're going to begin to phase down uh, our troop levels. And we've agreed with our allies that by 2014, this is going to be uh, an Afghan effort. Let's move to energy. Uh, you just got back from Wisconsin yesterday where you yeah. were looking at some solar and wind uh, plants. Here's Alexis from Florida. Dear Mr. President, in 2009 you said that you would reduce our dependence on foreign oil and boost our renewable energy efforts. Well, since 1974, the seven presidents before you said the exact same thing, and yet still, here we are. So what, so what will you do different in order to remove us from foreign oil and put us on the path towards renewable and clean green energy? This is why we made such a big emphasis on this in my State of the Union speech, and I talked about it yesterday. Uh, my first appearance uh, coming out of the State of the Union was at a plant, uh, a company called Orion, that specializes in creating uh, uh, energy efficient lighting, uh, saving companies as much as 50% on their electricity bill. Uh, then we went to uh, a aluminum plant where they're recycling aluminum. Then we went to a, uh, a place where they're making wind turbines. This whole clean energy space is one where we can put people to work, save energy, uh, save people uh, here in the United States a lot of money, uh, and free ourselves from dependence on foreign oil. But we're going to have to make some investments in innovation in order for us to be at the cutting edge mm -hmm. uh, of this clean energy race. Frankly, uh, we've lost some lead to China. Uh, just a few years ago, we were the leader in solar panels. China made a much bigger investment. They are rapidly taking over that lead. Uh, and so we've got to invest in innovation, invest in research and development. And the last thing we have to do is to create uh, a energy standard in this country where uh, a certain proportion of our energy, by law, comes from clean energy sources. That creates a market so that... Uh, you said 80% by 2035. Uh, if, if we get to that stage, then I am absolutely confident that uh, not only will uh, consumers save money, but we're going to be able to clean up the environment in the process and we'll stop sending billions of dollars uh, every day uh, to foreign countries uh, because of our oil purchases. You mentioned solar power, and there's a lot of individual entrepreneurs out there working out working in this space. Mm -hmm. R. Hill from Texas writes, I can build large solar panels with parts from eBay in my garage for under a dollar a watt. Why can't our nation's solar industries mass produce solar panels cheaper 
than some guy in his garage. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, he should go into business if he can, uh, yeah. if he can do it cheaper than uh, But how do you harness, harness somebody well, like that? Well, a, 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 uh, a lot of this may have to do with making sure that uh, small businesses are getting the loans and the capital they need. It, you know, it may be that uh, Mr. Hale in Houston uh, has uh, some capacity to, to uh, scale up, but he may just not have financing or the inclination to go into business. Uh, but as I said, part of it is just creating a market. In every new technology, uh, initially it's very expensive right. because it's new and not enough people are buying it. And if you have to make it one at a time, then it's expensive. But if you start being able to make 100,000 of them or 200,000 of them, then the unit cost of each one go down. The same is true with uh, clean energy. So what we've got to do is, is uh, make sure that there's a market for entrepreneurs out mm -hmm. there. Uh, and that's why something like a clean energy standard is so important. You know, it wasn't one of our official categories, I'll be honest with you, but we got a lot of questions on drug policy, uh, and maybe even more relevant. I think relevant. we did last year, too. <laughs> you know, uh, there are a lot of folks in line who want to know your thoughts on it, and I think with Prop 19 in California last fall, it's even more on people's minds. Right. Here's the top voted question in that area. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mr. President. My name is Mackenzie Allen. I'm a retired law enforcement officer and member of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. The so-called war on drugs has been waged for 40 years at a cost of a trillion dollars and thousands of lives with nothing to show for it but increased supplies, cheaper drugs, and a dramatic increase in violence associated with the underworld drug market. Sir, do you think there will or should come a time for us to discuss the possibility of legalization, regulation, and control of all drugs, thereby doing away with a violent criminal market as well as a major source of funding for international terrorism? Thank you so much for your time, Mr. President. Well, I think this is an uh, a entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. Uh, I am not in favor of legalization. Uh, I am a strong believer that we have to think more about uh, drugs as a public health problem. Uh, when you think about uh, other damaging activities in our society, smoking, uh, drunk driving, uh, making sure you're wearing seat belts, mm -hmm. You know, typically, we've made huge strides over, over the last 20, 30 years uh, by changing people's attitudes. Uh, and uh, on drugs, I think that a lot of times uh, we have been so focused on arrests, incarceration, interdiction, that we don't spend as much time thinking about how do we shrink demand. Uh, and this is something that, uh, you know, within the White House, uh, we are you know, looking at very carefully. As I said, Any ideas? Uh, well, the, uh, uh, some of this requires shifting resources, uh, being strategic. Where does it make sense for us to really focus on interdiction? Uh, we have to go after drug cartels that uh, not only are selling drugs, but are also creating havoc, for example, uh, along the U.S.-Mexican border. Mm -hmm. uh, but are there ways that we can also shrink demand uh, and you know, in, in some cities, for example, it, it may take six months for you to get uh, uh, into a drug treatment program. Right. Well, if you're trying to kick a habit uh, and somebody says to you, well, come back in six months, uh, that's pretty discouraging. Yeah. Uh, and so we've got to do more in figuring out how can we get some resources on that end of it um, and, and make sure that, uh, and also look at what we're doing when we have nonviolent uh, first-time drug offenders, uh, are there ways that we can make sure that we're steering them into the straight and narrow uh, without automatically resorting right. to, uh, uh, to incarceration, drug courts, uh, mechanisms like that. So th these are all issues that are, are worth exploring um, and, and worth, of a, uh, worth a serious debate. I want to get a health care question in here. The number one voted health care question came from Noah who asks, I have diabetes and some of my medicine is very expensive. Why is the same medication that I, that I use cost so much less in Mexico or Canada, even though it's being made, in, ma being made right here in the United States? We as a country need to fix this problem. Well, the main reason is, is that Canada, Mexico, uh, their governments are bulk purchasers of these drugs. And so they negotiate much cheaper prices with the drug companies. Uh, we still don't uh, do that. Uh, and uh, I actually think it's something we should do. Uh, it would save us money. Now, uh, the, the drug companies, as part of health care reform last year, did agree to essentially put in more money for uh, prescription drugs for seniors, make them cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they're probably not as cheap as they should be or could be. Uh, that was the subject of 
compromise through the legislative process, I think we could go further. So, so nothing in the health care plan will fix, right now, will fix this problem? Well, actually, if, depending on uh, Noah's circumstances, if he's getting prescription drugs through the Medicare program, then uh, our laws, what we're doing is we're closing the donut hole, uh, which is that portion of uh, the law that said uh, at a certain point you start paying full price for your drugs. Mm -hmm. So we are making prescription drugs cheaper for seniors and we're going to be phasing out that donut hole over the next several years. So uh, Noah may be helped if he's getting these drugs through Medicare. Uh, if he's getting them uh, through a private insurer, then we've still got to uh, do more work in the private health care plans to figure out how we can cheapen drugs. And it may be that importation is, is still uh, something that uh, we, uh, we should look at in terms of further lowering uh, the price of drugs. Another top voter health care question had to do with something that I know your wife is very passionate about. Mm -hmm. It's from Josh. My name is Josh Beertel. I live in Brooklyn, New York. Right now, we live in a country where it's cheaper to feed our kids Fruit Loops than it is to feed them fruit. I'd like to know, what are you going to do to reverse that? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, you know, the main thing I've done is uh, I, I, I have the first lady who is just driving the, uh, this, uh, this issue in an uh, incredible way all across the country. Uh, I don't know if you read recently, for example, that um, uh, she was able to negotiate something with Walmart where for the first time they're going to start putting labels on mm -hmm. their products yep. and also emphasize more healthy choices uh, for their customers. And what about cost, though, I think? It's well, what happens is when Walmart ends up uh, saying, we're going to buy healthier stuff, then suddenly all the producers say, you know what, we better start mm -hmm. producing healthier stuff. Uh, and that can make it cheaper. Uh, the other thing that we're doing, uh, for example, Josh there was just eating an apple. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is to encourage linkages between uh, local supermarkets, local farmers, local producers to figure out how can we get fresh produce in communities that are right now don't have access to fresh, uh, fresh produce. That's good for the farmer, it's good for uh, retail stores in underserved communities, and ultimately it's good for the consumer. Uh, the child nutrition bill that we just passed. Uh, is similarly working with schools to figure out how can we make sure that you're not just serving tater tots and pizza all day long. You know, are you able to get fresh right. fruits and vegetables uh, into the school uh, lunch program? So all these things are geared towards making uh, local produce, fresh produce, much more uh, available and cheaper uh, to uh, every family and not just uh, families who can afford to uh, go into high-end supermarkets. Right. You know, the last issue category that we haven't got to yet is immigration, and I want to show you this question. The, the audio is good, the video is a little janky, but I think you should be able to hear uh, what, what uh, Stephen Lee is saying right here. President Obama, my name is Steve Lee, and I am a Dream Act activist, currently studying to become a nurse at City College of San Francisco. Last year, my house was raided by ICE, and I was incarcerated for two months in a detention center in Arizona, awaiting my deportation to Peru. I was able to return to my friends and family when Senator Feinstein agreed to introduce a private bill to stop my deportation to Peru. The Senate has failed to pass the Dream Act because of partisan politics. Mr. President, will you help us make sure that there is a moratorium to stop the deportation of innocent students who qualify for the Dream Act? Thank you. Well, you know, Steve's an example of what I talked about at the State of the Union address. We've got incredibly talented young people who grow up as Americans, pledge allegiance to our flag, and are now at risk of deportation, not because of anything they did, but because their parents brought them here as young children uh, and uh, they didn't have their legal papers. And so I am a strong supporter of the DREAM Act. The reason I spoke about it during the State of the Union is because I think we should still be able to get Democrats and Republicans to work together uh, to solve this problem. Uh, I want somebody like Steve to study to be a nurse and uh, be able to contribute to our society. Are you hopeful this year that the Dream Act can get passed or something uh, like it? I, I am hopeful that uh, we should be able to get uh, this thing passed in part because in previous years we've had Republican and Democratic support for it. Uh, 
And this is one more problem that we can solve if we're not trying to score political points off each other, but mm -hmm. we're just looking at uh, you know, how do we uh, create an environment where uh, this is a country of laws and a country of immigrants. And, and we can reconcile those two values, but uh, we're going to have to do it uh, together. Let's move to our last question. Uh, this comes from Tom in Syracuse, New York. Mr. President, after the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the young people in the nation were challenged with learning maths and sciences so that the country could compete. What does America need from my generation to still be great when it's time to hand it to our kids? Well, uh, I talked about winning the future. I think that's what every American wants to see. Now, obviously, we're concerned about the immediate problems of unemployment coming out of the recession. But, but what we also want to feel confident about is that 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, America is still uh, at the top when it comes to technology, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to a dynamic economy. And I'm absolutely convinced that we can do it, but in order to accomplish it, we're going to have to outbuild, out-educate, out-innovate every other country. That's what we've always done. Uh, we're, all, we're going to have to have a government that is trimming its deficits, living within its means. Uh, it's got to be updated for the 21st century. Uh, but the most important thing we have to do is to make sure that young people like Tom uh, are getting the best education possible, that young engineers and scientists, they have the resources to, to create new products and new technologies, uh, that we've got a economy that's dynamic and rewards success, uh, but also uh, a economy that benefits from the best uh, transportation systems, the best internet systems, the best roads and bridges and airports. Uh, and, and so the, the goal over the next couple of years is to make sure that even as we're reducing our deficit, dealing with our debt, that we're still making some core investments uh, that are going to prepare us for the future. Uh, and I guess the last point I'd make, though, is, is that uh, as important as government is, what's most important is that this generation of Americans feel that same sense of confidence about the future that previous generations have mm -hmm. felt. Uh, and that we're willing to work for that future, uh, the same, pre same way the previous uh, generations worked for that future. Uh, it, you know, I, I want our kids to be uh, under, understanding that to win the future, uh, we're going to have to outwork folks. Uh, we're going to have to be disciplined. Uh, you know, uh, math and science may not be subjects that come naturally to some kids, but you need to learn them if you want to succeed in this next century. Um, you know, we need to reward engineers uh, at least as much, if not more, than we're rewarding lawyers and investment bankers in this culture. So, so you know, we're going to have to up our game as individuals. Uh, government can help. Uh, and what I've tried to do is to say, here's how we can make some investments in our future uh, that uh, will unleash what I know is the inherent uh, capabilities of the American people to, to create and innovate uh, that's unmatched by any other country on Earth. Oh, I'm afraid we're out of time, Mr. President. Time often flies when you're watching YouTube videos. But really appreciate you taking the time to bring the American people in here to the White House. There's an open and vibrant discussion on the internet about the future of the country. Absolutely. And for the chance for anybody across the country to just lean into a webcam or a video camera and have a chance for the President of the United States to answer their question, it's just a, it's a great symbol of how open and accessible government can be. So thanks for, for making it happen. Steve, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I appreciate everybody who sent in their questions. Uh, they were all outstanding. Great. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it.